right, so let's begin our message. As you know, that uh, we started this uh, message series called What is Truth? You know, we really live in a time of confusion, especially right now after the election. There's a lot of stuff out there. And so, you know, that's why all the messy squiggly line out there. But so this is a, a timely message. What is truth? And so we begin uh, the first question that we ask is, uh, when does truth begin? And we say that it always begin with God. We don't have the truth. We, don't, we cannot produce truth because truth is only in the person of Jesus Christ and through his words. And then we talked about uh, how is truth revealed. And it says it's through the Holy Spirit. It's revealed it's, you know, and through the inspiration and, and illumination. That's what we talked a few weeks ago. And then last week we talked about why is truth resisted and even among Christians. And we said that it's the main reason is because of our carnality. We're still living in the flesh. And so even though we can be positionally right with God, you know, because we are born again, but we can still practice our lifestyle to be very fleshly, very sinful, like the Corinthians were doing. And that's why Paul had to address that. And so today we're going to ask the question, how is truth applied? Okay, how is truth applied? And here's my proposition to us. Truth is always very practical, okay? Truth is practical. It's not just some theory. It's not just some concept, but it's something that we can apply, first of all, in our own lives and then to the lives of other people that we are helping. So go to turn your neighbor and say, truth is uh, practical. <clears throat> all right, truth is practical, all right? So um, last week, Paul used the analogy of uh, agricultural analogy like, I planted Apollo's uh, um, water, right? But this week, Paul uses a different analogy, and that is the analogy of from architectural, okay, or from like a building or engineering. And we're going to see that in a few moments. So let's all stand together as we read God's Word, uh, th th these five verses from 1 Corinthians 3. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But its person must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet only so as through fire. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, that in spite of all the confusion that's happening in our nation right now, Lord, we can look up to you as our source of peace, our source of truth. And we pray, God, that we will always focus on that. We will always focus on you as the Savior of this nation, O Lord. And that, Father, that we will rest upon your words and your truth. And so I pray right now, Lord, that you will speak to us and that you, Holy Spirit, will reveal to us, God, uh, just the truth that you want us to understand so that we understand, God, that the, your truth is always very practical and is always applicable, especially, first of all, in our own lives before we pass it on to others. Thank you so much, God. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So we're answering the question, how is truth applied? And from this uh, text that we just read, it's very, very clear that all of us are building something. Okay, Paul talks about that. You know, and I can apply like, you know, some of us are building a career. Some of us are building a, a, a marriage or, or a family or you're in school. You're building your, your education to, to develop that. And so to answer this question, I believe, first of all, Paul says that the truth is, has to be built or applied with grace. Okay, so I'm going to use the word build or applied same, uh, uh, synonymously. Paul says that we need to build with grace. This is what he said that we just read. According to the grace of God which was given to me. Paul never looked at himself as a superior uh, Pharisee or teacher or you know, follower of Christ. But he says everything that I do is always because of God's grace. And I think we need to see that, first of all, as the foundation. That, you know, everything that I do, like I said, in our marriage, in our, uh, our career, business, we need to see that I've, I'm able to do this because of the grace of God. It's what God has called me. Because, you see, the, uh, the truth of God, when we apply it in our own life or other people's life, it has the power to save and to give hope, okay, and to build if we apply it with grace, because the truth, when we communicate that truth without grace or without love or mercy, it can kill. 
And that's what the Pharisees have been doing. You know, this is what, what Jesus said to his disciples about the Pharisees. Therefore, whatever they do, okay, whatever they tell you, do them, okay, and comply with it. But do not do as they do, for they say things and do not do them. And they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as their finger. So Jesus was saying, look, what the Pharisees are telling is the truth. Do it. But you see, but, they only do it, but they're not doing it themselves. So don't do what they do, but do what they tell you, because they, what they're telling you is still the truth. But just don't follow what they're doing, because they are just hypocrites. They're not applying the truth to themselves. As a matter of fact, they use the truth as a burden to heavy people's shoulder here, to make their life heavy. That's what happened. When you apply God's truth without grace, without mercy, without love, it becomes suffocating. It becomes legalistic. It becomes, you know, uh, 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 it, it separates and it kills. And a good example I want to use here is um, the woman who was caught in adultery, okay? The woman was caught in adultery. The, the, the Pharisees was applying God's truth, but without mercy, which will lead to death. And so that is why the, the truth that the Pharisee, when, they, when the Pharisee brought the, the woman who was caught in adultery, here's the truth. Leviticus says, if there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. So they were telling the truth. They're applying the truth, but without mercy. And it was about to kill that woman by stoning her to death. But Jesus, on the other hand, still applied the truth but he added grace and mercy, and that leads to life. And this is the story in John 8 when, when, when you know, Jesus you know, bowed, uh, he uh, knelt down and he wrote something and he says, anyone who uh, doesn't have any sin, cast your first stone and everybody start leaving. And this is what she, he said to the woman, right? And straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on. Do not sin any longer. You see, Jesus, by the fact that he said that, you know, don't sin anymore, that means he sees that adultery is a sin. So he's still not, he's not compromising with the truth. He's simply applying the truth, but with grace and mercy. And that taught the woman, it gives her life, it gives her hope, because now she says, you know what? I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to do this ever again. And now she has a new life. Because the truth was applied with God's grace and with grace and mercy. Where the Pharisees apply the truth devoid of grace and mercy and only leads to death. And so that's why when we apply God's truth, whether it's our own life or others, you know, we need to apply it with grace and mercy and love. And that it will give us that life. You know, when, I, um, when somebody asked me to do their wedding, to officiate the wedding, I always said, okay, I will, but I need to do three counseling, minimum, okay, three separate counseling. One is uh, to talk about the spiritual union. That means they have to, have to be, be born again. Second, I talk about the emotional union or the soul. You know, we talk about man and woman uh, think differently, respond differently, emotionally different, and so on. The third one, I talk about physical union, you know, sex. And, that's the, you know, and at that third session, that's when I ask them a very direct question. Let me just ask you now. Are you sexually active already? And back in the old days when I started ministry, you know, 30 years ago, it's, it's, uh, most of the time they would say no. But now, you know, the last 10 years, I would say that uh, when I ask that question, I would say more than half will say, yeah, they're actually already active. And that's when I have to confront them with the truth. You know, I, if I confront them with the truth but I, uh, and I don't use grace, I will say, I'm sorry, I can't do your wedding because you're sinning. I can't do that. Okay, you, you know, that's, that's bad. You know, you already commit, you know, fornication, all that stuff. So I'm sorry, I'm going to walk away. I can't do your wedding. But no, I will tell them, I, I want to apply grace and mercy. I said, listen, what you're doing is against the God's word. It is sinful for you to be active right now before you are married. And I need you, and I explain that. I, I, I tell them that you need to repent. And if you don't stop, right now, then unfortunately, I won't be able to do your wedding. So I'm not compromising with the truth, but I give them a chance. I give them the grace and mercy. Look, it's for you to repent, to make things right with God and with each other, and many of them do, and therefore, I was able to do their wedding. 
And so, church, that's just the way we're supposed to be. When we apply God's truth, but always with grace and mercy. And, and, and it's with anything else. You know, right now we have, you know, LGBTQ is, is very prominent and it's very, you know, it's everywhere. But, you know, the truth is right here in Leviticus 20, verse 13. If there's a man who sleeps with a male and, a, and those who sleep with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They must be put to death. They have brought their own death upon themselves. Church, when you meet somebody, whether it's a coworker, maybe a family member, whoever is your neighbor, and they happen to be, you know, uh, uh, gay or lesbian, again, you, you, you can't compromise. You have to still tell them that it's wrong if you have conversation. But again, you have to apply God's grace and mercy as well. Lead them. Tell them why. And, 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 I, and I, the same thing, you know, when, uh, when I, you told, you know, the story, I'm not going to get into it, but, you know, uh, in 1990, I remember a priest was so attracted to me, you know, and so, I, I mean, you know, he, he wants to have a relationship with me, and, I, and I, I had a conversation for a good half an hour with him. I mean, he was so adamant he wants to have a relationship with me. I said, no, that is wrong. And I explained to him the Bible, but I don't reject him as a human being, as a person, because I see him as a person who is lost, who is deceived by the enemy, that thinking that God created him as a, 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 a homosexual or gay. And so, church, we need to always apply God's truth with grace. But here's the second thing that Paul says in the text that we read. We need to also build uh, on the right foundation. We need to always apply God's truth on the right foundation. Look what Paul says in verse 10 and 11 again. Um, he says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But look what he says. But each person must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So it's very clear here that when we apply God's truth, okay, it has to be applied or based on God's foundation, not in any foundation. So I think you agree that the foundation of a building is the most important component of the building, right? I mean, when you look at this picture, it's not very attractive. There's nothing cool about that picture. That's the foundation. When you were coming in, you, start, you see how they start digging the ground now because they're going to lay the foundation for our new building you know, in, in between these two buildings. And so when you see it's just dirt, it's kind of nothing attractive. It's dusty. They're going to excavate that. They're going to lay the foundation. And, and so you can see here that foundation is not very attractive to look at. But we agree that this is probably the most important part of the building because a, a weak foundation, a, an unstable foundation, will impact the whole building and it becomes very unsafe. And we don't see the foundation once it's covered, but yet it's the most important thing. And then what, what Paul was saying earlier, be careful how you build. Even though you're applying the truth, but if the truth is applied on the wrong foundation, you're going to get a disaster. And so you may ask the question, okay, so what kind of foundation do people build on? You'd be surprised. Let me give you some examples. Some people like to build their foundation on profit, on money. It's all about money, right? A lot of companies do that. Now, it's not wrong to have profit because your company needs profit to, be, to survive. But if that is the foundation, the most important thing in your business principle is profit, 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 then unfortunately, you're going to compromise people's health or safety because all you care is profit. When I think about uh, cigarette companies, they don't care about your health. They don't care that it burns, you know, people's house or it stinks up your, the pollute the air, you know, pollute your lung, pollute your clothes. Pollute. They don't care. All they care is profit, money. As long as we can sell, as long as people are stupid enough to buy a cigarette and smoke them, we don't care because their foundation is profit. That's a wrong foundation. Some people build their foundation on power and control. And maybe that's what's happening right now in our government, right? Because government, although it's ordained by God, is supposed to be doing God's will. But if the men and women in the government is not God-fearing men and women, then most likely they're probably all about control and manipulation and about power. So they don't care about the nation. They don't care what's good for the citizens. All they care is that I want power and I want control and I'll do anything to manipulate, to do whatever so that I can get into power. That's the problem. Some people may build their foundation on fame or popularity. I want to get famous. I want to be, you know, I want to be uh, popular. 
at school, at work, at whatever it is, in Hollywood. All I care is that I, and I don't care how I get there. I may have to sleep through a lot of people. You know, I may have to lie. I may have to cheat. But because that's their foundation, because I just want to get famous. And here's the last example. Some, uh, and this is more in religion, some uh, is based on human traditions or human rituals. I just happened to choose you know, Mecca there. You know, you, you know that that's one of the pillars of, of, of Islam, that they have to try to go to Mecca you know, and kiss that magical stone, whatever it is, and a lot of people got trampled and die. But you know, that's a human tradition. Who started up, you know, it's not God. God never asked us to do this. And this doesn't have to be applied just with Islam. It could be Catholicism, it could be Christianity, it could be you know, Buddhism, Hinduism. A lot of times we follow human tradition, rituals, as our foundation rather than God's Word. And so we need to ask ourselves sometimes, are we building on God's truth and the right, right foundation? Because the only foundation that we want to build on is what Jesus' life and how He died and rose again, and now we have His words through the Holy Spirit that reveals this truth on us. That's the only foundation that we want to build our life, our marriage, our business, our career, everything on. Let me give you an example of what I mean that you can apply God's truth on the wrong foundation and you will get a disaster. You know, you believe that the Old Testament, of course, is God's word. That's God's truth, okay? We all agree that. The Muslims b- believe in it too because they believe Mo- Moses is one of the prophets, you know, great prophets, and, and they agree with the Ten Commandments. They don't kill, you know, it's all supposed to kill. But unfortunately, they build that on Islam, the foundation of Islam and their, their, uh, their uh, religious book, the Quran, right? And when you put God's truth but build on the wrong foundation, what do you get? You get a monstrous effect. I mean, some of you who are from Indonesia, you know even in Indonesia, you know, uh, some places, I mean, the Muslim, they'll burn churches, they will kill you. You go to some of these Islamic countries, and when they will kill you when you, you know, again, uh, do not convert or if you convert someone else because even though they believe in that truth that we talk about the Ten Commandments, but they will do all kind of things. It's, it's very, it's very uh, constricting, you know, and, and it suffocates. There's no freedom. It's all about rituals, and it's about, you know, and it's especially the fanatical one, you know, like ISIS who will decapitate you or, or kill you or even kill your children if, if your children convert. What kind of monstrous religion is that? I mean, I saw a video that was so disturbing. This is many, many years ago. A woman in the middle of the street who refused to wear those covering for, the, for women, and then a, 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 a nicest man, a Al-Qaeda man, just come up to her and pop her in the head with a, with a handgun, and just like as she's shooting a, a cow or something. And everybody's just watching it in the middle of the street, just videotaping. So when you put even God's truth, but it's built on the wrong foundation, you will get a monstrous effect, crazy death. And this is why is we need to apply God's truth on, first of all, to ourselves with the right foundation. This is what Jesus meant when he told that, that parable. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock, right? It's solid. And the rain fell and the flood came and it blew and slammed against that house that it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears this word of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who builds his house on sand. And the rain fell and the flood came and, you know, it blew. And then look at that, what happened, the disasters, right? So he, God is, Jesus is comparing here, wise man versus foolish man. A wise man will always build, apply God's truth, first of all, in his own life. We need to apply, first of all, in our life and make sure that our life is founded on the foundation that Jesus built, which is his life, death, and resurrection, the gospel. And that's why he compares the rock versus the sand. Sand is very unstable. It may be easy, but it's very unstable. And look at the result. He says one will continue to stand even in, in time of trials, but the other one will collapse, completely destroyed. And this is why we want to build on the right foundation. When we apply God's truth, first of all, in our own life, we must build it on the right foundation. But here's the last one that I, th- I see Paul's teaching us. Um, it's not only uh, God's truth, it's not only applied or built with grace, but number two is uh, on the right foundation. But number three, we want to build with amazing quality. 
Okay, we want to build with quality. We want to build the best because this is what Paul says. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. Okay, he's using six different uh, materials. And the first three is different than the last three, right? Because gold, silver, and precious stone is very different than wood, hay, and straw. But look what he says. Each one work will become evident, for the day will show it because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each one's work. Church, we want to build with quality because one day our work here on earth will be tested with fire, and you know that these materials will have different effect. The fire will have different effect on these materials, right? Let me give you a couple examples of what I mean by this, I believe. Number one is the longevity or durability. I think you agree, right, that gold, silver, and precious stone will last a lot longer or more durable than hay and wood and, and straw. And then this is why Paul says that if anyone's work has been built remains, okay, he will receive a reward, but in verse 15, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. So when you compare... You know, when you're building your house, your character, your business, whatever, are you going to build with gold, silver, and, and precious stone or with hay and straw and stuff like that? You know, when you, when you look at this picture of King Tut's of mass, it was built with gold. It was constructed around 1300 B.C., I think, and it was founded around 1900. Somebody found it, okay? So it's almost 3,000 years old. But that gold mass is probably looked just as good back then as it is now because gold will last thousands of years. But if you look at straw or hay, how long would it last? You know it's not going to last very long, right? Wood maybe it lasts several hundred years if it's a good quality wood, right? But, but you know, when it's straws and hay, how many days or weeks, maybe months at the most? And not only that, when you compare these materials, the first half is not very combustible. But the second half is very combustible. Hay, wood, you know, and straw are very combustible, and the test is going to be fire. So it's going to be, you know, will it last? Will it? And so how, what does that apply for us? Uh, I believe that when wherever we're building, you know, whatever we're doing for the Lord, some will have a longer durability, some will be more longe longevity, you know, compared to others. And how, what does that mean? Let me give you an example of that. Now, again, this is what I believe. You may disagree with this, but some of the things we do for the Lord will have longer impact, lasting impact than others. So, for example, I think when you are willing to go and share the gospel to your neighbor, to your coworker, to whoever, that has the potential to be very durable and, have, and last for a long, long, long time. Because the seed you planted in the person's life, maybe somebody else is going to water it, and maybe one day it's going to be harvested, and one day that person will receive Christ. He's going to live forever, eternally you know, in, in heaven. That means your work that you did when you shared the gospel to that person is going to be, you know, very durable. But when you see a young, uh, young, when you see somebody, let's say a homeless person, you drop a dollar in his cup, is that wrong? No. Is it bad? Of course not. But how long will that last? Maybe a cup of coffee for 10, 15 minutes that he'll buy? But yeah, but are you saying we should not do that? No, of course. We need to be, we need to be kind. We, we need to do that. I mean, Jesus it did say that when you feed you know, this, uh, one of these least one, you, know, you do that to me. So we need to be kind. But let me make a suggestion to all of you. When we give that dollar, why don't we also plant a seed in his soul? Tell him about the love of Jesus. Because if you only just drop a dollar in his cup and you walk away, how does he know that you are how, about, about Jesus? Maybe he, he can say, okay, this guy could be a Muslim, he could be a Hindu, he could be a Buddhist, he could be Hare Krishna, he could be an atheist. So he received that dollar, oh, thanks, you know. But you walk away and he has no idea about the love of God. But if you just take one 60 seconds, hey, I want to bless you. Because God has blessed me because Jesus, you know, and you give that $1 or $5, it could be a seed that's planted in his heart that one day can blossom and he may receive Christ. So I'm suggesting to you that, yes, do good, but be smart. Add some value. Just plant the seeds. You know, um, I've been a member of AAA for, since 1986, so it's been a long time. So AAA likes to send me all kind of promotion. And... Um, 
So I, a, a few weeks ago, I called AAA to, to cancel that promotion. You know, I said, I don't want it. You know? And so the lady asked me, uh, would you like to get a car quote, an uh, insurance quote? I said, sure, I, I'm always looking for a good quote. And so she passed me on to the next woman. So we were talking on the phone, she was asking me my questions, my cars and everything, and then, so I asked her, I said, are you, are you, where are you from? And she goes, well, I'm from Texas, but I uh, am living in Ohio right now. And I said to her, uh, oh, why you moved to Ohio? And he goes, well, uh, oh no, sorry. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm from Canada, I said, but I moved here in 2006. I said, oh, she goes, I want, I want to move to, to Canada. I said, really? I said, why do you want to move to Canada? She said, well, because I don't like what's going on in our country right now, what's going on in our nation, and I, I, I want to move to a, a, a safer country. And then that's when I segue and I went in. I said, you know what? Um, whenever I go back and to visit my family, I said, people wish to ask me, I said, uh, which one do you like better, Dallas or Toronto? I always tell them that the best place to live is where God wants you to live. That's what I always tell them. Because God has a plan for us. And I was able to share with her, insert into her, you know, telling her about that. And she began to agree, you know, and I didn't convert her. I didn't tell her I was a pastor. The whole conversation, she doesn't know I'm a pastor. I just did it because I wanted to plant seed in her heart. And so she gave me a quote, not a very good quote, but, you know, uh, and, but I said, thank you. And I said, can I pray for you? She goes, yes, sure. So I began to pray. And again, I put God's word in my prayer for her, for God's safety, and, and so on, and then so on. And you know what? She didn't, you know, she didn't, she didn't convert right there and then. I never met her. We may not never see each other again. But I used that conversation as a way for me to build longevity in the, what I do for the Lord, not as a pastor, but as a believer, as a child of God. And so I want to encourage you, church, let's build with quality let it be a, a, a longevity, durability, which you want to build, not just something that lasts only a, a few seconds. Secondly, I would say that the cost is very different. You know, silver, gold, I mean, gold silver, and, 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 and um, precious stone is much more costlier than hay and straw and wood, right? I mean, if you receive this gold ring with diamonds, okay, obviously it's going to cost a lot more than, let's say, this trinket, you know, this uh, wooden piece of carving, now, of course, you appreciate if your loved one gives you this. But the point is that whoever buys that goal is going to be much, much costlier. It's, it's uh, you know, the effort, whatever it, it costs that person. And I believe, how does it apply to us? I believe uh, whatever we do to the Lord, for the Lord in ministry, you know, how much does it cost us? What kind of sacrifice is it? You know, I, I, I don't think it's wrong for me to say this, that if somebody who have a good life on, in America and they felt like God is calling to go to mission field, let's say, and that person gives up a, you know, a, a good job and gives up a, a sacrifice, you know, his, his comfort and moves to some third world countries for the gospel and even risks his life or her life and even loses, even, even die for it. That is a much different cost than, let's say, if we serve once a month in a daycare here. Is it wrong to serve once a month a day? No. Does it mean it's not worth anything? Of course not. But I think we have to be honest. It's, gonna, it's a different type of sacrifice that people pay. And I'm not saying that we all should be missionaries out there, but how much does it cost you to serve the Lord? You know, uh, when Mimi became a believer, it cost her a lot for her to follow Jesus, to serve the Lord. Because the first two years, her mom cut off the relationship because her mom was a strong Buddhist. She didn't want, you know, because she was so disappointed with Mimi that she just cut off the relationship for two years. But it doesn't cost me anything for me to follow the Lord back then. My parents are Christians. They want me to follow the Lord. They push me to follow the Lord. It cost me nothing when it comes to that area. But God began to call me into ministry, and that cost me. You know, my dream to be an Air Force pilot. I mean, to, to be a, you know, a top gun type of, a, of, of pilots. And God closed that door. And then I tried to aviation, you know, to got my commercial license. But God kept on choking me in a sense that calling me and calling me. And I have to let that one go. And I got into the Navy and everything. And I got into the best program in the Canadian Navy. I was so happy. And then God began to call me again. I have to let. So for me, my cause was that for me to let go of my career that I want to do. 
And so I remember when I resigned from the Navy, I, I just, I felt so pain in a sense. I like, Lord, this is the most painful thing I've ever done. So I want to give to you. Even until now, whenever I drive on 121 and I see airplane, you know, landing in DFW, my mind is always thinking, it could have been me up there, you know, traveling. I would wonder what it would be like in the cockpit there, traveling around the world. When I see somebody in a, a naval uniform, I said, oh, I should have been wearing a uniform too, you know. And sometimes thoughts, of, it's, it's constantly that, you know, that God reminds me, but that's the cost, that's the sacrifice. And I want to do it because if God wants it, I want to serve him. How much does it cost you to serve him? You know, it's not how much in money, but it's the sacrifice. This is what Jesus was teaching in Luke 21. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor you know, widow put two very small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave in their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. So it's not the amount, but it's a sacrifice. And this is why, you know, when God talk about tithing, it's interesting. You know, whether you have a, you know, if you make a thousand dollar, tithe is a hundred. But if you make ten thousand dollars, tithe is a thousand. So of course, one thousand is more than a hundred, but it's equal sacrifice. And so God is asking, are we willing to sacrifice? Are we willing to build for Him with quality? And so uh, Paul continues. He says that there's going to be a test there. The fire itself will test the quality of each one's work. And if each one's work will, he has built remains, he will receive a reward. This is not talking about salvation reward, okay? So we cannot earn salvation. But just like you work hard at school, you get scholarship. Just like you work hard in your, you know, in your job, you will get promotion, whatever it is. The same thing in the kingdom of God. When we work hard, when we build with quality, God will reward us. It's all over in the Bible, okay? God's love is unconditional, but the gifts are based on our work, our faithfulness. I mean, Romans talks about God will repay each person according to what they have done. Paul says, you know, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. So it's a prize he knows, and he wants to work hard. He wants to achieve it. And in the last chapter of the book, the Bible talks to Revelation, says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Church, we have to remember that one day, all of us as believers, we will face a judgment seat of Christ, okay? Paul makes it very clear right there. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us will, will receive what is due us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Please understand, this is judgment not for salvation, okay? That's for unbelievers. This is judgment for the rewards, the word judgment seat here, one commentary says that it's not a judicial type of judge, but it's more like Olympic, where the judge will give you a gold medal or, uh, or bronze or silver, you know, and the Olympic stadium, which is outside of Corinth, actually. And, you know, so, so this is what he's talking about, not salvation, okay? So everybody's safe, but you will receive different types of rewards. And you may wonder, what kind of rewards? Well, I don't know. But the Bible is very clear. There's one type of reward that we will receive, and that is the crowns. And there are five types of crowns you may, may or may not know. But, you know, the first crown, it says the Bible is a crown of righteousness. This is when Paul talks, you know, I fight a good fight of faith. I've finished the race. So that means being persevering, you know, just pushing on. Not to be tempted, not to be distracted. You, you, you follow Christ. You do that, you're going to get a crown of righteousness. The second one is an incorruptible crown. This is when Paul talks about uh, 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 an athlete. This is talking about discipline. Because all of us are undisciplined, right? There's temptation in our body, our mind, everything. We need to discipline. And, and, and Paul talks about that, that you will get a, an incorruptible crown. The third one is talking about crown of life in James, where it talks about that, you know, going to trials. And, and all of us go to different kind of trials. And, and maybe some Christians are even persecuted and, and die for their faith. And they will receive the crown of life. The fourth kind of crown is interesting. It's crown of glory. If you read the text, it's very clear that the passage is talking about for pastors here, for shepherds, because he's talking about shepherding your congregation right. 
with the right motive and all kind of stuff. So this is for elders and, 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 and pastors. And, and that's something I really want to get to. But the last one is crown of rejoicing. And one commentator says that this is where every Christian will get. Uh, whether I agree or not, I'm not quite sure. But uh, it says that you know, this we will receive when we meet Christ. So if that's true, what the commentator says, then at least you get one crown, everybody, okay, minimum. But some of us will receive five crowns, some of us only one, some of us two, three, four, whatever it is. And, you, and I know there's no jealousy back, uh, uh, when in heaven, but it feels great, isn't it, when you receive these crowns? You know, when, I, when Nicholas was still a Boy Scout, I mean a Cub Scout, you know, he, uh, whenever he does something, you get a badge. You know, that you receive different badges, you know, Cub, you know when you're in a uh, uh, Boy Scout. And you feel good when you go up there, you get the badge, you get, they put it on for you, and, and you can sew it on on your, on, your, you know, on your sleeves. It feels good. It's like soldiers when receiving all these uh, medals, Medal of Honor, Medal of Valor, Valor of you know, Bravery, whatever it is. And there's nothing wrong because they're saying, look, I serve my country. I risk my life. And my commander-in-chief is giving me this medal in recognition of my service for this country. Church, won't it feel good when we come to heaven and our commander-in-chief will recognize us for building quality work on earth? And he gives us different crown, different crowns. I want to encourage all of us. Let's build with quality. This is what he means, that all of us will receive what is due to us. Remember that. But, you know, church, how do we do this? Okay, how does God judge us? And let me just uh, uh, wrap up with this a few things uh, quickly and how I believe he will judge us with regards to how we will receive it. And I want to use the, the acronym of FAT again, like last week, but it's a little bit different, F-A-T. Number one, I believe it's our faithfulness. Our faithfulness with the resources God has given us. And I categorize this in three different ones. Number one is our time. Our time is a limited resource that God has given us. I believe one day in that judgment seat, God will say, okay, I give you 80 years. I noticed that 20 years of that, you're playing games, social media, TV. I don't know if he's going to do that or not. Okay, I'm, I don't think he'll condemn us, but he will do an accounting with us. We all have 168 hours a week. How do we use that? Is it for the kingdom of God or my kingdom only? doesn't mean we shouldn't have fun or leisure time or fun, but be balanced. That's what I'm saying. Number two is our treasures, okay? God has given us, some of you, maybe access to millions of dollars because of your whatever inheritance, your parents, whatever it may be. Some of us, maybe not. But whatever it is, are you going to be faithful with the, re with the money that God has given us? This is why it's interesting. When people cannot trust God with even 10%, you know, uh, how will God bless us later on in heaven with much bigger thing? This is what the Bible says, right? If you cannot be trusted with even a ma with, with money, with, you know, temporal thing on earth, how can I trust you in heaven with eternal things? So money is really just a, test, a tool for testing us. Are we going to trust God to follow him, that he will provide for us, that he, we give when he wants us to give, whether it's 10% or 50%, whatever it is, as God leads you, and God leads us, and so we need to be able to trust him. And lastly, of course, is with our talents. And talents here could be our spiritual gifting, it could be our skills, whatever it is, whether it's playing music, whether it's art, whether it's business, but you all have been given gifts, talents, spiritual gifts. Are we using that to build God's kingdom or my own kingdom? And you know, this is the, 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 the story in the, the parable when, when the master was going away and gave the talent to three servants. And the text tells us before he calls them, he says that the text tells us that after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. I like that phrase. It's a very powerful phrase, but it's a scary phrase. He's basically going to call each one of his servants and he's going to do an accounting. It's an accounting term. You know, my parents have this very small business that they have almost 40 years ago. And my sister runs that business for most of those years. But a few years ago, because of her health and other issues, they decided to pass it on for me to, to run. 
So I'm still learning. But at the end of the year, we always sit down together, my sister and I, and we do an accounting. I got to show to her, because she's much more experienced, every dollar, because I'm accountable to, to my parents, and ultimately to God, because it's God's business through my parents, and I'm just a manager. And, you know, we, sometimes we, I cannot find certain money, and we, we would wreck our brain. Where was that money? Where did it go? You know, we look, we look, we look, we look until we can find it. But I'm accountable. It's not my money. I'm accountable to make sure the book balance and everything because I have to give account for every dollar that it was given to me. Church, this is what God is talking about. One day all of us are going to be accountable before God. God is going to call each one of us one by one. And he's going to say, okay, I've given you time, I've given you treasures, and I've given you talents. Let's take a look what have you done with it on earth. And at that time, I can say, well, Lord, I dig a hole. Remember the third servant? I know you, so I just didn't do anything. We will be accountable for every hour, every dollar, every gift that God has given us. Number two, A stands for action. This is what we do with our life every day. Look what he says again. For we must appear before judgment of Christ so that each one of us will receive what is due. But look what he says. The things done well in the body, whether good or bad. In the body here, our physical body. That's what we do every day. What do we do with our body every day? Do you know that you and I are the crown jewel of God's creation? Because you and I are the only one that has a physical body in a sense that has all three, spirit, soul, and body. Angels have a spirit and a soul, but no physical body. That's why they're jealous of us. That's why demons, which are fallen angels, they want to possess people's body, right? Because if, if there's a demon of alcohol, you know, that likes to get drunk, in order for him to enjoy drunkenness, he has to go into a, a person, makes that person or influence that person to get drunk, let's say. If it's a violent spirit, demon, you know, he has to manifest itself through a person. That's why you remember Legion, the man, that's why he, when Jesus was going to cast out the Legion, they begged Jesus, please send us at least to the pigs. At least they have a physical body so they can manifest. Animals have bodies, but they don't have a spirit. But you and I, we have a spirit and a physical body. Man, this is the best. So when I look on the news and I see people rioting, looting, you know, hurting, killing, raping, whatever, they will be judged because they use their physical body and their mind and their soul, whatever, to do harm, to damage, to hurt. But the Good Samaritans, when we use our body as a temple of God and to do good, to, to serve the widows, to feed the homeless, to serve those who are hurting, spending time with people who need help, God is gonna reward each one of us for that. That's action. And lastly, T stands for transparency. That is your motive. God is going to check our motive. Look what he says in verse 5. It says, Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motive of the heart. At that time, it will receive their praise from God. You know, if you want to build a house with gold, silver, and precious stones, you need to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is it because I want to be, to have the most expensive house on the street? Is it because I want everybody to know that I'm the richest man on the street? That's why I'm building with silver and stone, you know? Or is it because I really want to build the best quality for the Lord? So whatever we're doing, whether singing up here or serving, you know, back there, whatever, are we doing it with the right heart, with the right motive? Am I doing it because if I don't, I'm going to get a phone call from Aaron and I'm not going to like it, you know? Or because Pastor is telling me to do it or my parents telling me what to do it. Or because I want to do this from my heart to serve my Savior because he's giving me these gifts and these talents. He will check our heart. And God tests me this a lot too. When I want to see this church grow, sometimes I have to ask myself, is it because... I really truly want to see the kingdom of God grows or is it because I want to be known as a successful pastor? I need to ask because sometimes our heart is very deceiving. 
So we need to ask ourselves, do we do it with clear conscience, with good motive? So as we end, church, again, truth is practical. We must apply it, first of all, in our own life with grace, right on the right foundation, and to build with quality that lasts, that really costs. And so let me close with this story that um, I've told before, I think. But, um, you know, in 1984, um, Mimi and I went to a, uh, a mission conference called Urbana. It's uh, every two years or three years, I think, and it's 20,000 students, you know, plus, you know, come together. And I remember many speakers spoke there, you know, Billy Graham and other speakers. But there was one speaker that I'll never forget. I don't know what it is, but I always remember her. And her name is Elizabeth Elliot. And she was speaking about, also mentioning about her husband's, uh, her ex, uh, not ex, but her, you know, husband that passed away. She was a widow. And so uh, his name is Jim Elliot. Many of you know him. Okay, and Jim Elliott is, is the guy in the center here. And uh, he, you know, he had a good life in the sense that he went to, they went to a Moody Bubbles Institute, you know, college in, in Chicago. And uh, he, uh, he was very popular, well-liked. I think he was a president of the, uh, of it, the, the, you know, the student union thing. He was also the captain of the uh, wrestling team, so he was very athletic, popular, and everything. But you know, he gave that all up. He could have stayed in the U.S. He could have just do whatever he wants, you know. Even when they were dating together, they po he postponed the wedding because he just felt, I need to serve the Lord. So he went on a mission field for a year or two before coming back and marrying his sweetheart, Elizabeth. And right away, he took her back to the mission field. And these five men, these five missionaries, they went together because they felt they, they want to reach this vicious tribe called Aqua, you know, in Ecuador, I think, a uh, 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 um, tribe that wants to, that are vicious and kill. And, they, and one of them was a pilot, you know, he was, uh, they began to drop tools to soften their heart, you know, as, as gifts, you know, and, and through a bucket, because he was able to fly in a circle and using a bucket, drop uh, some tools, and then they also returned something back. And so they were building that relationship. So finally, they felt like this is the right time. So they flew the plane and landed by the, uh, by the river. They built a tree house, and they started building contact. And it seems to be positive. But I don't, we, don't, we don't know what happened. But suddenly, five men, five of the tribal men came and speared them all to death. They died trying to reach this tribe with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I think what makes him quite famous was that, um, you know, these men inspired so many other young missionaries to come. You know, it, 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 it's a powerful story when you read it because the, the two of the widows came back to the tribe years later and reached the village and they were converted. And the five men who killed them, killed their husband, converted. And even one of them, later on, years down the road, end up baptizing one of the sons of the kill uh, uh, missionaries. That's reconciliation. That's restoration. And so what makes him famous, especially for Jim Elliot, was that seven years before he died, he wrote this statement. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep and to gain that which he cannot lose. So basically, he was saying, look, Everything that I have on earth, all the fame, popularity, money, whatever, I can't keep it anyway. So it's not so stupid thing to let it go. But when I convert that into heavenly rewards, I can't lose it because it's waiting there for me. One day when I come before the Lord in the judgment seat, He will reward me for all the sacrifice that I've laid down in my life. I've given the best. I've laid it on the right foundation and I've built with all the best quality I can give. And so my question to you is the same thing. Church, are we willing to apply God's truth in our life, first of all, and to build it upon grace, build it on the right foundation, and let's build with quality in everything that we do. Let's do our best for the Lord whether it's being on time for a service, whether it's giving our money, whatever it's doing up here, let's give our best to the Lord. 
And God is going to look at you. We, you. Some of us may not recognize you doing your best, but God will see it, and He will reward us for that. Well done, good and faithful servant, even when no one sees it. So we will be surprised when we go to heaven. I think we will see many, many, many people rewarded that we never heard of them. Some obscure individual working in a kitchen or working in a, a small church in a village somewhere. And all these mega, mega pastors maybe not get anything. We don't know. But let's just do our best to the Lord. Let's pray. Let's take a moment as usual just to reflect what God is saying to you, to each one of us through this message. Are we applying God's truth in our life, first of all? If we are, let's do it with grace. Let's do it in the right foundation and with good quality. So take this moment right now to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to encourage us. How can we apply this message now in a practical way in my life now?